Good evening. This is InfoWars Nightly News, and I'm David Ortiz. It's Monday, October the 29th of 2012, and here's what we have in store for you tonight. Tonight, gangs plan hurricane looting spree via Twitter. And with Hurricane Sandy bearing down on the Northeast, panic buying grips the East Coast as concern mounts about the safety of spent fuel pools at nuclear plants. Then, globalist vote observers may be arrested in Texas. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Good evening. Well, here comes Hurricane Sandy. A major storm has already hit the New England area and the New York metropolitan area as well. According to an article written by Paul Joseph Watson today that was posted on the Drudge Report, the headline reads, Gangs Plan Hurricane Looting Spree Via Twitter. The article says scores of Twitter users have flooded the social networking site, announcing their plans to go on looting sprees over Hurricane San once Hurricane Sandy makes landfall. As the New York National Guard announced, it would put troops on duty in Long Island to prevent such activity. The article goes on to read that about 1,100 National Guard troops will be patrolling the area. And... This is obviously going to continue um, the topic of looting. We've been talking about that for quite a long time now. Um, obviously, the more the, eco the economy collapses, the more you see on Twitter that people are threatening to loot. And later on in the article, it reads, it shows some of the Twitter hits. One of them says, I'm looting if she gets crazy tomorrow, referring to the storm, obviously. Another one reads, y'all going to get hit by Sandy should meet up and go looting. I'm looting today in preparation for the hurricane. And it just goes on and on. Another one reads, so when does the looting start? And obviously, as you could see by the photos, these are individuals of different ethnicities. Um, it just seems that more and more Americans um, seem to want to loot if times get bad. And again, as the economy continues to collapse, as the police state continues to grow and people continue to get upset, you will see more threats of looting. Now, last week we talked about how many people on Twitter, and this isn't just five or 10 or 20 people, this is thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people on Twitter that are threatening to loot. Last week, there were many people who were threatening to loot if Obama lost the election, uh, as if to insinuate that Obama is such a wonderful president, almost like Gandhi, and how dare we uh, take him away from us. He, he's so wonderful. But um, we, we did a story on that last week, how many people on Twitter threatened to loot as well. And these are tens, these are thousands of people who are threatening to do this. And um, sadly, this is going to be a common occurrence as uh, the economy continues to collapse. People are going to look for an excuse to get some food on the table, to get some goods in their home. Now, in other news, but on a similar topic, also posted on Infowars.com today, Americans riot over baseball. How about an election or a hurricane? And the article was also written by Paul Joseph Watson. It talked about how yesterday many San Francisco Giant fans showed their love by showed their love of their team by um, well torching many things. They were looting. They were rioting, and. Um, you know, the Giants won in four games. Could you imagine what they would have done had they lost? But sadly, this is something that we often see, a dynamic we often see when people's sports teams win. People think the best way to uh, celebrate it is by hurting their neighbors and uh, torturing cars and local businesses. The article read that police were forced to break up riots in San Francisco last night as Giants fans celebrated a World Series victory by setting fires, smashing up vehicles, and letting off fireworks in the street. Posing the question, again, if Americans are willing to riot over a baseball game taking place in another city, how will they react to a contentious presidential election result or a breakdown in order, in, in order following this week's Frankenstein? So there you go. There's more rioting, and we just continue to see this unfold throughout the nation, and that's what the globalists want. The globalists want this because then they get to pose as saviors and say, you know what, we're going to need a surveillance state. We're going to need a police state to protect you from yourselves. 
They won't say that the reason why this is going on is because most Americans are broke or in a horrible job or their dollar is being devaluated. No, no, no. We're doing this because we're evil. Now, despite the economic collapse, the, despite the situation we find ourselves in, we encourage people who are watching this newscast to not participate in this. We're better than this. We need to yell at the globalists. We need to, we need to protest against the globalists. Could you imagine if people were out on the streets like this over the NDAA bill or over the surveillance state or over children being chipped in San Antonio or over corruption? The knuckleheads in Washington wouldn't be doing what they're doing. So we obviously encourage people to remain peaceful throughout this time. And in other news, panic, another article written today on Infowars.com reads, panic buying grips the East Coast, mad rush for supplies ahead of megastorm. And this talks about how many people are fighting uh, over the past several days and right now as we speak to get their hands on food, to get some gas, to fill up their tanks. And um, the article reads, while many people are still trying to make up their minds about the potential severity of the storm threatening the U.S. Northeast, it's not stopping millions of concerned residents from racing to grocery stores, gas stations, and hardware deposits in droves. Now, if we scroll down that article, we'll see that there is a picture that was tweeted recently. This is a real picture. This is in a stock footage of, uh, of a supermarket in Middletown, New Jersey. And that was a real photo that was tweeted. The shelves are almost empty. And um, again, scenes like this will become more and more common. There's a movie that's out right now that we've been promoting. Uh, it's an independent promoter called Gray State, and they show scenes like that as well, empty grocery stores. And again, this is all part of the economic collapse. Now, right now, we're going to speak to Dan Badandi. He's one of our fellow reporters. Dan Badandi is in Rhode Island right now in the heart of the storm. He went to go visit his family this past weekend. Obviously, that trip was planned for a while, and um, coincidentally, it falls uh, around the same time that Frankenstorm uh, is occurring. So Dan is going to be reporting uh, to us uh, in just a second, and he's also going to be, I believe, on Alex's radio show uh, tomorrow, and he's got another story that we're going to air later on in this newscast. So let's go over to Dan. So welcome, Dan. Thank you for joining us on the InfoWars Nightly News, buddy. How are you doing, Dave? I'm all the way from Providence, Rhode Island, and it's crazy, man. The weather is picking up bad. Yeah, buddy, tell us a little bit about that. First off, for those who don't know, you flew out there this past weekend, but what's the weather looking like out there? Is it is it really bad? What do you see? Oh, when I flew out here, it was nice out. I mean, all the way here, the flight was great and, you know, good weather and just turned to nothing. <laughs> Basically, the weather dropped, the clouds come rolling in, winds picking up, and they're up about 40, 50 miles an hour, I believe, and uh, they're supposed to go to 90. Uh, you got waves that are almost uh, uh, 10 feet high, I believe, in some places. And it's really bad out there. And it just, again, it's like basically within hours of time, you know, this morning, things started going to the worst. Wow. And it's only going to get worse. Oh, yeah. They said it's supposed to pick up to 90 at least. And they're calling for a Category 1, maybe 2. Uh, that's what we heard from the weatherman. And they're still tr trying to downplay the other storm front that's going to collide. I mean, that's why it's called the perfect storm. I mean, we're looking at a probably disaster here, and um, this is everything I got told by that Homeland Security guy, which is my um, my uh, report coming after this. But yeah, I got some uh, statistics here. Uh, there's 569 power outages right now in Rhode Island. It, that's 69,000 customers out of power right now, and our power here has been blinking. So hopefully, we can get this report out on time before the power goes out. And uh, you have the, um, that's uh, breaking news from uh, ProvidenceJournal.com. They're reporting that Connecticut, they closed Route 95, which is an interstate highway that runs all the way north through Canada, all the way to Miami, Florida. And that's one of the biggest highways in the country. And they're closing, um, you know, Connecticut to close Route 95. And another article here, uh, Rhode Island Governor Chafee, He's talking to Mass and Connecticut officials, Massachusetts and Connecticut officials, about closing exit roads on Interstate 95, which they already have. This was reported earlier. They already have closed major uh, highways down also, besides 95. And they got National Guard all over the place, down at the oceans and everything. And um, 
I didn't get a chance to go out today, but tomorrow I want to go out and get some footage of the National Guard. And I heard on the radio today when I was going to the store, I didn't get a chance to record this, but um, they have um, Homeland Security in FEMA coordinating this whole entire uh, disaster thing. And when you hear Homeland Security, when you hear FEMA, it spells, to me, disarmament of the American people, spells violation of the Constitution, and it spells tyranny. And um, we don't, you know, know what's going to go on yet. But I mean, like, um, this could turn out bad. This could be just, you know, go the other way, whatever, which we're hoping. But um, also breaking news here from Prodigy's Journal. Uh, they're calling for mandatory evacuation ordered for some uh, Rhode Island cities here, which already have. They evacuate all of South County in Rhode Island, which is Westerly, Bristol, and South Kingston in Charlestown, Rhode Island. And also parts of Connecticut have been evacuated, and um, Jersey, where you're from, Dave, uh, the Jersey hey. Shore has been act- uh, evacuated, and uh, man, it's crazy. And um, now, got more- Dan, uh, let, Dan, let me ask you something. Um, the stores, I mean, have you visited a local supermarket yet? I mean, what what, well, yeah. what is that like? It was insane. I mean, like, um, we, people just uh, wiping up the shelves based with the canned goods and the water. I mean, I got some of the footage uploaded on our YouTube. Hopefully, we can get it out uh, tomorrow, or whatever. But uh, uh, we got the gas pumps. Uh, all the, yeah, there's yellow signs on the gas pumps. Basically, they're out of gas. This is out of water, but you go inside. They said they're out of gas. They've been out since four o'clock yesterday afternoon, and um, people just going crazy. And it's the mainstream media also sp- uh, spreading its fear mongering. I mean, you should see the news on some of the clips in the radio. Uh, you better have startable foods, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong, but they're pushing people. They're going crazy all over the place here. And, and uh, we have a hurricane and, update. And let me, uh, let, let me ask you one more question, because you kind of cut out a little bit, and I didn't really hear the answer real quick. I, I heard some of what you said. But what, what are the stores like? You said they were crazy. I mean, are the shelves empty? How are people behaving? Um, shelves with, with water and um, the shelves with canned goods and all that, they're empty. I mean, there's still food on the other shelves, but uh, basically the per- non-perishable goods are gone. Wiped off the shelves. The gas pumps are all empty at the gas stations, and uh, it's crazy down here. Now, let me ask you one thing. You, you talked about... Um you know, that the media is going crazy. They love this stuff. They act like they don't. They absolutely love it. It's, it's a rating, uh, ratings bonanza. But um, what's, what's the average Joe acting like? I mean, are, is he or she nervous over there, or do they just expect this to be a typical hurricane? Um, you got the generic people out there who are going out by, you know, the bread, eggs, and milk, and all that good stuff. But the normal people here in New England, you know, they call it the big disappointment. Not that it's a disappointment, but every year we get threatened with a major category hurricane, and people are like, you know, it never comes. We get a little bit of it. And people's, general people's attitude around here, they're like, yeah, whatever. If I see it, I'll believe it. I mean, that's the, the attitude of people. But, uh, but then you got the, um, you know, regular moms, the regular, you know, parents out there who are going out to the stores, wiping them out clean with the bread and everything else. And uh, we had a, up, a hurricane update in uh, Rhode Island here from uh, golocoprov.com. And they're talking about basically this could be a true natural disaster. 90 mile an hour winds are calling for. And um, tides up to uh, seven to eight feet is reported here, but I heard some radio uh, shows and also the news on the Internet that they're going up to 10, possibly 12 feet in some places. And it's causing major tidal damage on uh, the shores and everything. Beach property, because there's a lot in Rhode Island. I mean, we're right on the ocean just about. And um, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and uh, Block Island, and through three major islands here, and big tourist places. And that's sustaining sustainable damage down there. And um, it's crazy. And, you know, again, people, you know, the thing is, people are out there at the beaches right now. They're out there watching the waves come uh, pounding in. You know, and it's, it's, it's crazy out there. And I can't wait to get out there myself. Hopefully, not to swim. <laughs> well, yeah, I like to bring the boogie board out there or the step board, whatever. But. No, I know, right? Now, Dan, um, real quick, what have you done? You personally, I mean, you've got fans here at InfoWars. What have you done? Have you bought, you know, food? Uh... Oh, yeah, we stocked up on plenty of water, plenty of food, plenty of ammo for, uh, you know, just in case, uh, God forbid, civil unrest, whatever, and uh, for looters and all that. So we were pretty much stocked up here. And. You got the candles, uh, you know, the little tiny generators that keep the refrigerator running, and, you know, all the generic stuff, basically, to survive at least a week or two, you know, if something happens. Now, now, Dan, um, we're going to see your piece later on in this newscast, but you've got the floor for the last two minutes. I mean, what do you want the public to know? 
Um, just want the public to know that, you know, we called for this. We've been saying this for a long time, and if you do not believe in geoengineering, because I've seen a lot of comments on my YouTube already, uh, how could the government, you know, the government orchestrate weather and um, hurricanes and everything? If you don't believe in this, folks, it's on public records. HR 2977, that's the Space and Preservation Act of 2001, they openly say chemtrails, uh, weather modification and such, tectonic weapons, all stuff that sounds like Star Wars, that's in this bill, it's supposed to protect us, but it never passed, of course. It was a world treaty part, you know, to go to the world treaty, to, you know, to protect us from these such weapons. And you got China, you got tons of articles in there. China, I believe it's Germany, and um, uh, the United States openly mitten, bragging about, yeah, we modify the weather. You know, I think it was an article about China um, during the Olympics that they made the weather good, they said, for the Olympics, to hold the weather for the Olympics. And um, there's so much information out there, folks. Just just type in uh, HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, or geoengineering or weather modification in Google, and uh, hit click on news. You're going to see mainstream articles. Uh, you got um, the London Telegraph. you got BBC all reporting on this, uh, Russia Today, stating that, yes, um, we control the weather. This is not a conspiracy. This is not a secret no more. They're openly bragging about this. They write books about this, uh, documents and everything else. And again, H.R. 2977, the Space and Preservation Act. I mean, folks, this is not a joke. And um, we think this is, could be the October surprise that we've been talking about. The October surprise is coming into November. And that Homeland Security guy who works for FEMA, which is only FEMA's under Homeland Security, as you're going to see in my, um, uh, my report coming, he openly states to me that basically – at the end of October, early November, now I have this on record, folks, of me telling people back in August this was going to happen. I talked about the drills. I said there was going to be drills up here, up in New England, and it happened. And I said there's going to be some kind of disaster to hit the East Coast the end of October, early November, and here we go, right here. And we got 50-mile-an-hour winds and going up to, uh, they're going for 90 or more probably, whatever. And uh, we're going to see what happens. And I hope to God this guy's wrong, but right now he's been... 100% true, and I'm, I'm going to save it for the report, and Dave, um, yeah, just wanted to let you know we're all safe down here, and we're prepared for this. Yeah, God bless you, Dan. We're, you know, we hope that you stay safe, safe up there, and uh, if the electricity is still up, you know, we're, we're looking forward to see what you have to say in coming days. Oh, uh, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to go down to the ocean, hopefully, if we get through the National Guard there. I mean, they got the National Guard everywhere, Homeland Security, FEMA, and everything else, and, um, yeah, we're going to see where, what I could get and where I could go. And um, we got poles down up the road. That's why I couldn't really go that far, just to the gas station. And, um, you know, it's just it's crazy. It really is. And people, you know, again, you got people who are like, yeah, whatever. And some, most people are just raping stores clean, you know, and it's crazy. All right, Dan. Thank you so much, buddy. Thank you, Dave. God bless. God bless. And it's important to note as we talk about Hurricane Sandy that quite quite possibly this could be the elite's way of getting the world to support global warming. Obviously, if New York or the greater New York City area is severely damaged, the world will see that from New York City to Tokyo. As the saying says, when New York City sneezes, the world catches a cold. And uh, if this storm... Um, wreaks havoc on the greater New York City area, you could expect the globalists, the United Nations to say, you see, we told you, now you're going to need to have a pass a global carbon tax because global warming now is obviously not debatable. So let's be mindful of that. You're not going to see that in the mainstream media. The fact that this could all be uh, engineered to, pro to promote the global warming cause. We know that weather, weather modification is something that is done. It's, it's very easy to manipulate the weather. Um, if you ever notice, the, the Olympics never gets canceled because of rain. Have you ever noticed that? You never see a major snowstorm happening during the Olympics. It's sunny as can be. And that's because it's used in weather. Weather modification has been used during that time pe period. And you can see that. You can Google that. U.S. Olympics weather modification and stories will pop up. So let's keep that in mind. And in other news, this was also posted on Infowars.com. The header reads, How to Prepare for a Hurricane, Some Lessons That Preppers Can Learn from Hurricane Sandy. According to the article, written by Michael Schneider of American Dream, if you are just starting to prepare for Hurricane Sandy, the truth is that you are already too late. Most 
of the essential supplies have already been stripped from store shelves. If you don't have an emergency generator, you might be without power for quite some time. And the article also notes that in Ohio, there are many supply stores that are receiving phone calls from people from as far out as Maryland saying that they need supplies. Can they be shipped over to them? So obviously, it's a serious um, concern what's going on. The article reads, an assistant manager at a Lowe's store in Columbus, Ohio, told 10TV.com that people were calling from West Virginia, Maryland, to ask for supplies. The article also points out that all heck is breaking loose at many gas stations in Montgomery, Pennsylvania. It says the lines at the pumps at Sunoco on Valley Forge Road were three or four cars deep this past weekend and one of the employees at the gas station says she said she's never seen the gas station so busy not even before a snowstorm she says quote people are complaining screaming yelling they're yelling at me and there have been fights between customers it's been a big mess so obviously the situation seems to be getting dire um but you know, we obviously hope, we wish people the best. And according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the destructive potential of this storm is rated 5.8, but that is on a scale that goes to 6. So we're not trying to uh, scare people. I mean, we're just telling them the facts. That's according to federal officials. Um, the storm is rated a 5.8 on a scale to uh, on a scale of one to six so obviously it's a very very severe situation we wish them the best and it's very important to note that this is why we encourage people to take action and protect themselves we here at Infowars we promote gun use legal gun use um, we obviously promote uh, getting a food supply and uh, recently a, a DVD was created and produced by Alex called Strategic Relocation. And it talks about places, oh, let me get that there. It talks about places where obviously you can relocate as um, the economic collapse continues and rioting continues to happen. It's called Strategic Relocation. You can get that at InfoWarsShop.com. But again, we've got eFoods Direct where you can store food for your loved ones. Um, you know. I always tell people, are, is your family not worth $500 to $2,000? I mean, that's all it would take to arm yourself with a gun, with food supplies, and, and um, with things of that nature. And remember, during Katrina, police officers were ordered not to stop citizens from ransacking. So this idea that the cops will come to your defense is not necessarily the truth. And, um, you know, there have been many studies that show, believe it or not, and we're not saying this is going to happen this upcoming week, but there have been studies that show, you can look this online, that after seven days, when people haven't eaten for seven days, they're willing to become criminals. But after 15 days, they're willing to become cannibals. So obviously, the situation can get dire as the dollar continues to collapse and food supplies continue to uh, leave the supermarkets. And in another article posted today on Infowars.com, it reads, Hurricane Sandy may score a direct hit on spent fuel pools at nuclear plant. The article notes that there are 26 nuclear plants in the path of the hurricane and that the spent fuel pools in the plants don't have backup pumps. According to nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson, she says that You'll hear in the next two days, quote, we've safely shut down the plant. However, she also notes what Fukushima has taught us is that doesn't stop the decay heat. You need the diesels to keep the reactors cool. And once again, that there are 26 nuclear power plants in that region. And one of the power plants where the storm is directly headed towards is located in the town of Oyster Creek, New Jersey. I know the area well. Sadly, that's a lot of people here uh, have family there. It says that in Oyster Creek, there's a nuclear power plant, and it is the same as the Fukushima Daiichi Number 1. Oyster Creek is one of the oldest U.S. nuclear plants and is the same design as Fukushima Unit 1, and obviously that was the name. Fukushima is the nuclear power plant in Japan. So obviously there are a lot of things that can occur as a result of this storm and we should really 
um, again, use uh, situations such as this, events such as this, to prepare us for future uh, catastrophes. Um, if everything goes well over the next couple of weeks, for, as it will for many people, you know, use this, um, you know, natural catastrophe to prepare yourself for a future one. You know, uh, don't be left behind next time without food, a gun, or things of that nature. Now, in other news, not, uh, other non-Hurricane Sandy news, the headline reads, Mississippi town sued for school-to-prison pipeline targeting minorities and disabled. And the article says that a Mississippi town is facing a lawsuit for operating schools that handcuff and send children to prison for minor classroom infractions, like violating the dress code or talking back to teachers. It says students in the town of Meridian sometimes spent days in a prison 80 miles away from their school without a probable cause hearing. They were not read their Miranda rights and sometimes spent more than 48 hours waiting for a hearing, which violates their constitutional rights. Later on in the article, it reads, students were jailed for, quote, dress code infractions, such as wearing the wrong color socks or undershirt, or for having shirts untucked, tardies, flatulence in class, using vulgar language. You get the point. Basically, this school is basically throwing people away to prison uh, without due process for doing the most simplest of things. This used to be called child play, but now it's called a crime. You know, if you, uh, I don't mean to make light of it, but if you pass win now in class, you don't deserve to go to the principal's office. Uh, you deserve to go to the local prison. That's what people in uh, the town of Meridian, Mississippi, uh, feel you should, should, should occur. So again, this is all part of conditioning your garbage the police state is growing to heck with due process. We see that with the NDAA law. We're going to break laws. You need to get used to it. And um, now they're treating students as criminals for the most minor of offenses. And once again, all part of the conditioning process, all part of the, the growing police state. But notice, they don't do this to the local school board member who steals $5,000. They don't say, we're going to throw you in prison and uh, we'll talk about it after the case. They only do that with students. They don't do this to the police department that has pensions. I'm not saying that specific town, but they don't do this to the police departments that have pensions that nobody can afford, that the taxpayers can't afford. They don't do this to uh, the criminal element in the police department. They do this to you, the people. So there you go. Another, another uh, situation of the growing police state. And in other news, this was also posted on Infowars.com, Texas warns globalist vote observers they may be arrested. And it reads later on in the article, the United Nations affiliated group has dispatched election monitors from Europe and Central Asia to polling locations around the United States to document voter suppression activities by conservative groups, the Hill reported last week. Liberal-leaning civil rights groups met with representatives from the OSCE this week to raise their fears about what they say are systematic efforts to suppress minority voters likely to vote for President Obama. Now, uh, Governor Rick Perry of Texas, along with many neocons here, are basically saying, uh, no, 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 the, the UN is not welcome here. We honor sovereignty. And that sounds nice in theory, but yet Governor Rick Perry and other neocons demand that the United Nations have monitors monitor um, other countries' elections. And if they don't, well, then they're, you know, they're, they don't want democracy and they're a bad country. But when these UN uh, monitors who, from what I understand, aren't really going to do anything but basically breathe over uh, the officials here. Um, when they come over to the United States, then, you know, you're not allowed to do that. That's evil. Now, listen, the United Nations is obviously a corrupt organization. We're, we're not saying that they're the good guys. Uh, it just seems like these, these are two different groups of people pointing the finger at each other when they're both partake in criminal activity. What are you afraid, Governor Perry, that maybe that the U.N. finds out that we are involved in fraudulent elections, that some of the elections have fraud going on. And uh, once again, if in fact you're all about sovereignty, well, that sounds noble on the surface, then do, do me this favor. Don't demand that the Iraqis have, quote, transparent elections. Don't demand that the Afghanistan uh, citizens have transparent elections and then demonize them when they don't have UN monitors um, monitoring their elections. Um, I think it was President Carter, who obviously was a horrible president, but he said um, the United States obviously has a lot of fraud going on in its elections. 
So um, it seems, again, once again, these are two criminal uh, groups, two ridiculous groups pointing the finger at one another when they're both doing things that are illegal. The United Nations is obviously a corrupt organization, and uh, we have um, fraud here in the United States as well. So take that for what you will. Uh, officials from the Justice Department are saying they're going to rule on the matter later on this week. So there you go. Tweedledum, Tweedledee, as Governor Gary Johnson says, pointing the finger at one another. And now let's go to the daily quote. And it says, while the Secretary of Defense suggests this capability might be possessed by terrorist organizations, the U.S. military continues to deny that they also control such technology. And that was from Dr. Nick Begich, obviously. He's talking about the hypocrisy of our government. And, uh, you know, we're allowed to have nuclear weapons, but if another country has nuclear weapons, they're evil. We're allowed to spy uh, with drone airplanes, but if you spy uh, on us with drone airplanes, that's an act of war. We're allowed to practice military uh, war games on the Straits of Hormuz, but if China practices in the Gulf of Mexico, they're evil. Um, it, it talks about the hypocrisy of our country. Never confuse great ideals with great government. The United States has great ideals, in my estimation, the greatest ideals. But our government is far, far from great. And uh, obviously, we have some of Nick Begich's books at InfoWarsShop.com. He's a great author. And if you're interested, one of the books that we have is called Angels Don't Play This Harp by the doctor and there is another book that we have called controlling the human mind so once again if you want some food for thought you can go to infowarshop.com and check out those two books now in just a minute we will return i recently conducted an interview earlier today with doctor will spencer of vibrantbees.com now mister doctor spencer is uh... focuses on the honeybee he has his own bee farm, and he's going to be talking about the colony collapse disorder, which is a major, major issue and is affecting everyone watching this newscast right now. He'll tell you how in just a minute. I want to share a story. Back in August, when I traveled to Austin, Texas, I met a man from uh, Homeland Security and uh, he also worked for FEMA, whatever, and uh, he was a ground transportation coordinator. A long story short, when I got to talk to him, he was an Alex Jones fan. You know, he's been working for um, FEMA for about 17 years. I think it was 17, 18 years, whatever, but um, yeah, I learned he was an Alex Jones fan. I had an InfoWars t-shirt on, whatever, and um, he spotted me, and I started talking to him, asking him about certain things about, because I heard him on the phone talking to his brother. And he was talking about Jenna Napolitano and all that. But anyway, long story short, he told me that he got called on an emergency meeting that day to fly to uh, Washington, which was at BWI, Baltimore, Washington International Airport. That's where I met him. I was on a uh, layover waiting for my flight. And he told me um, a very interesting story. And he said, uh, they don't tell me everything. This is his words. They don't tell me everything. But he goes, they called me on an emergency meeting today, and he's looking around, and I'm like, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I got, I'm here with a few people, but I gotta be careful. And um, so he goes, anyway, I'm in, uh, what they told me was that um, they called me right, you know, today, they called us emergency, get to Washington now, you're on express flight, basically. And um, he was heading home, and he said he, his job as a uh, grounds transportation coordinator is to organize 20,000 metro city buses. And he said they fit 65 people by regulation, by, but you could jam at least 100 people in those buses if you had to. He said they, he had his job to organize 20,000, that's 20,000 metro city buses along the East Coast and key points of the East Coast. And he goes, Something big is coming October, November. He told me that. He goes, October, November, there's going to be something big. He goes, I don't know what it is. They don't tell me everything. But he said, it's going to be in the guise of a natural disaster. And he told me. He said, when you go home, you know, because I told him what I was doing. Whatever, he goes, when you go back to Rhode Island, okay, within a week from then, they're going to be organizing uh, disaster drills throughout New England. And sure enough, this was not announced on mainstream media either. Sure enough, 
well, it was announced like a day before, and they, you know, it was on one place that the mainstream media was talking about. Sure enough, when I went home, you know, a week later, boom, there was a natural, you know, natural disaster drills being conducted by FEMA, just like he said, and by the National Guard, just like he said, a joint exercise. Well, the mainstream media says how oh, they're conducting one in Exeter, Rhode Island. I'm sorry, uh, near against Rhode Island. And they only mentioned one, but there was three in Rhode Island and several in Massachusetts. I managed to get to one, which I have the video on my YouTube, and um, basically they were uh, conducting a natural disaster drill, like he said, communications are uh, being gone, a natural disaster, and power outages. That's what they were conducting, just like he told me. And he said there's going to be a natural disaster. He said, I am not sure what it is. They don't tell me everything. But he said my job was to organize and get together the 20,000 metro buses that they need on the East Coast. And um, real scary stuff. And he showed me documents in his briefcase. And it ran on, it says FEMA Homeland Security right on the documents. And I mentioned about the FEMA camps, the internment camps which is on record, HR 645, Army Regulations 210-35, FM 3.9.40. Uh, and anyway, um, I, I told him, I said, I've been to one of these camps. I've seen one with my own eyes, actually, two, and the third one being built. And uh, he goes, where was that? And I said, Fort Devons, FMC Devons. If you go to Google Earth right now, type in FMC Devons, Massachusetts. That's a uh, uh, Army Field uh, Medical Center. And if you type that in, and you um, go east toward there, and zooming in, you're going to see prisons there. Now, there's a state prison near there, but that's not the one I'm talking about. And they just built a whole new facility. Now, it's empty. They have uh, trucks patrolling and everything. But anyway, I mentioned this to him. He goes, hold on one second. And you're getting looking around, and he goes, opens a document, another book, and he's flipping through the pages. And he goes, this is what you're talking about? And it was a satellite image, all the statistic data of that camp. And Fort Devon's mask. He goes, yeah, it is disguised as a um, you know, medical center. And I told him when I went there, because I know I got uh, friends who work at uh, federal prisons. They don't have government license plates. All the work is coming in, they had government license plates. Homeland Security FEMA badges on their uh, uniforms as well. I'm saying to myself, this is not a regular uh, federal prison camp. Not at all. Anyway, um, he described this. He showed me the layout, the data, and said they're building another one, which is already built now, up in because it's been a couple years since I've been, uh, been up there. He goes, there's three of them over there. Three of them. And exactly how I seen it, he described, he showed me the map and everything. But he said, again, they don't tell me everything. He said, be aware, they're going to have natural disaster drills up there, up in New England. There's going to be a, a, a martial law called in the guise of a natural disaster. And he said it's going to be late October, early November. And he goes, coincidental, just in time for the elections. He told me that back then. And you see mainstream media folks calling for an October surprise. And we've been saying it's October surprise is going to be in November, which is basically at the beginning for the elections. So basically, um, we, uh, we're getting ready for the storm here, and I'm going to go out on the field, I'm going to go to the beaches, I'm going to go to the places. I've been to the gas stations, folks. Gas stations are out of gas. I'm going to go on the road today and show you the stuff. But the gas stations are out of gas. The supermarkets are whipped out. I mean, they're spreading fear-mongering about the storm. And yes, it could be a really bad storm, as we think it might be, because, of, you know, again, the guy's to call for martial law, to evacuate, which Rhode Island has already evacuated several cities, folks. Several South County cities have been mandatory evacuated. So, um, and they have National Guards out there. We're hopefully going to take a, a ride down there today and get all this on film. Uh, but, folks, um, I, I'm just fearing for the worst because right now, uh, everything this guy has told me has come true to a T. And um, we're going to get all this on video, and um, I hope to God they don't call for martial law, because you know what that means, gun confiscations, even though when I confronted FEMA, they said, they, we don't do that. I'm like, what about Hurricane Katrina? Oh, we never did that. It's on mainstream media. <laughs> you know, they even showed the National Guards going from door to door confiscating weapons. But anyway, they're not going to get my gun, and, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, um, 
a lot of propaganda out there, folks, to say, oh, we're all here for your safety. Get on the buses. We're going to take you to a safe place. But anyway, um, I'll get back to you folks. I'm going to show you some videos of the gas pumps being out of gas, signs everywhere, no gas. Uh, water is like bottled water you can't find anywhere. Generators, forget about that. And, um, you know, I hope this guy is wrong. I really do. While we fight to retain our liberty, while we fight to expose globalism, we have to realize we're talking about a very powerful combination of power. Renowned author and expert Joel Skousen breaks down the globalist plan to shut down America and stage a new world war. In one day, America will go from day to night. And if you haven't prepared in advance, there's not enough time to prepare in 24 hours, even if you saw it that early. Coming to the Info War in November is our new documentary film presentation. Strategic relocation is a systematic way to think strategically in the future about how do I safeguard. Joel Skousen, Strategic Relocation. The freeways are going to be crowded. They're going to run out of gasoline. They're going to run out of food. And then they're going to start to go north and south of those freeways. Joel Skousen is renowned as one of the world's foremost experts in strategic relocation and the securing of your home. We talk about natural disasters, the health environment. We talk about pollution, the water quality. My personal experience about being in every one of these states. Government is digging in for the organized incremental collapse of society and world war. The U.S. isn't building huge underground bases and bunkers because of some terrorist threat. They know that a massive nuclear attack is coming. They want that attack to come. Most people won't even be ready and won't be able to get out of town when any of these nuclear weapons fall because there'll be absolute panic. There is no preparedness without strategy. What I tell people uh, is that you do have time. Prepare wisely in advance. This Christmas, give the gift of preparedness. Strategic Relocation, the film, with Joel Skousen and Alex Jones. My friends, Alex Jones here with a very important announcement. We are launching a new salvo in the info war because there is a war on for your mind. You know that the globalists are trying to get everybody online and only online so they can control and surveil information and also erase books, videos, whatever they want to in mass. That's why we're launching our answer to the internet kill switch, InfoWars Magazine. The first issue, we printed over 90,000 copies of a September issue and it sold out in less than two days. So get your copy of the new technocratic elite issue today before it sells out. Again, we cover from the technocratic social engineers own words, their own admissions, their plan to take over our society and replace us with robots. But we don't just stop with the rise of the robots and the end of humanity or will humanity survive the singularity. We get into the government buying now 1.6 billion bullets against the American people. We get into Big Sis's surveillance of this magazine and my website, InfoWars.com. We cover QE3 and what hyperinflation means to you and your family. Whatever you do, don't look back later and wish that you would have taken action. Take action now. People have never been more ready for this information. People have never been this hungry, starving for the truth. And it is contained in the new issue of InfoWars magazine. This is a time capsule. It is so important we get it out to everyone. If you subscribe now for 12 issues, we will give you the first issue 
absolutely free. So that's 13 issues for our 13 colonies, part of restoring the spirit of 1776 worldwide. Again, go to InfoWarsStore.com and order 10 packs, up to 100 packs at cost, and give them out to people in your area. The response last month was incredible. People are hungry to actually hold this information in their hands. You can also subscribe and get 12 issues delivered to your door and get the first inaugural issue free. I'm Alex Jones, thanking all of you for your support and making our operation a huge success. Welcome back. Well, we are now joined by Dr. Will Spencer of VibrantBees.com. Dr. Spencer is an expert in bees, specifically the honeybee. And the doctor is going to talk a about a lot of issues, including colony collapse disorder and how this affects you, the viewer. Doctor, thank you for joining us here on InfoWars Nightly News. Glad to be here. Now, uh, doctor, briefly tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, uh, I had bee, I've had bees for quite a while, and uh, I've uh, actually had some problems with, uh, with my honeybees, which led me into discovering a lot of things um, with the health of the honeybees, because mine basically died because of surrounding farming and other contributing factors, which led me to developing some solutions for my own personal bees and then started to share that with other people. How long have you been uh, studying honeybees and working with honeybees? Oh, since about 2000. Okay. Now, um, doctor, most people do not know a lot about honeybees. It's obviously not a, a topic that they talk about quite often. Um, explain to us why are honeybees so important? I mean, a lot of people just think that they're annoying in, uh, insects that just fly over our potato salad. But uh, tell us a little bit about the honeybees and why they are important to us. Well, in the uh, industrialized food chain that we have today, they say up to 70% of our uh, food is due to the honeybees pollinating of the crops. Uh, they, they move, uh, the agriculture moves the bees around from crop to crop, like from all the almond pollination in California to the citrus to the apples up in Washington and the pears and the cherries. The importance of the bees in agriculture allows for the production of the plants to be much greater than they normally would be because the bees are moved into the fields to help the flowers, more flowers get pollinated. So therefore, the, f the production of food increases on the same amount of land. So the bees are extremely important because they're helping us get more production out of the land, out of the, f out of the uh, crops, because normally there's not that many na native pollinators in the areas around the fields, so they're moving the bees into the fields, around the fields, to help with the pollination. Okay. Now, for the past uh, couple of years, doctor, we've been hearing about colony collapse disorder, colony collapse disorder, and how it's very important that we acknowledge the issue. Uh, tell us a little bit about this concerning trend. Well, my, uh, my research and uh, investigations have led me into several contributing factors. Um, not well, only, not contribute. Tell us a little bit about colony collapse disorder. Well, Some colony, people don't even know what it is. Well, colony collapse disorder, uh, on a whole, on a general, is the uh, the bees leave they, their colony collapses, meaning they the bees actually leave the colony, um, or they die, and they're not. Uh, there's roughly 60,000 uh, 60, bees in a healthy colony, and uh, the colon, when the colony collapses. There's, there could be just a handful of bees left. 
and they're not they're not even dead in the hive they're just gone there's nothing their the bees are gone sometimes there's a queen left or some just a few bees but the majority of the the bees leave for one reason or another okay and this has been occurring this has been occurring really big time since about 2006 is when it first started in Florida my understanding is and that was because of the, uh, they, they, they say because of the uh, introduction to some of these pesticides that have been in the food chain now. And that all started roughly in about 2006. Okay. Now, well, what type of impact has this been having on our food supply? Well, the, uh, the, the overall loss of the bees is directly related to the, the food prices because we're having less food less flowers pollinated because we're having less bees it's also putting a strain on the 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 honey industry because we're having less bees now there's less hives some beekeepers are losing up to 80 90 percent of their bee colonies so some of the larger beekeepers having several thousand hives they have they're losing 80 percent of their hives in one season they have to spend a lot of extra money to rebuild their hive population so they can continue to do their livelihood, which is pollinate crops. Now, now how has this negatively impacted, um, you know, uh, what type of economic impact has this had on people in your industry and in other industries? Well, it's driven up the cost of honey. It's, it's um, for instance, a lot of the honey in this country now in the, in the, uh, in the conventional market is actually not even honey. They're, they're supplementing it to keep the price down. It's driving the honey prices up. Mm -hmm. uh, in the food, because of the lack of pollinators, the f and we have that, that equates into less food production, so it's driving the cost of food up. Uh, the, uh, it's also causing, in the, in the beekeeping industry, it's driving prices up because of the, the supply and demand of hives, of bees, of queens, um, it's causing pollination um, costs to go up because there's less bees to do the pollinating. So they, they therefore the farmers have to pay more to get to uh, attract beekeepers to send their bees to certain po uh, like almond pollination or apple pollination. So it's costing the farmers more because there's less bees available. So it's a simple s supply and demand. Okay. Now, what is the cause of this? Well, there's several theories. Uh, my own personal experience is it's directly related to pesticide use. Um, um, my, the small farm that I had my bees on, the bees were doing fine until they switched to using pesticides around the fields, around the land where my bees were, my, uh, my, uh, my hives were. And by the second year of the pesticides being used, I lost 12 hives. Um, the, uh, in the pollination, the uh, migratory pollination, there's the overworking of the bees because bees naturally take a break in the wintertime. While the pollination, the bees that do the pollination year round, they're trucking their bees all over the country, so they're severely stressed. Um, in Europe, they've proved now that the uh, electrical smog or the EMS in the environment is directly related to uh, the stress on the bees. Because you can take a phone, especially a smartphone, and just leave it on and set it on the entrance of the hive, and eventually, within a month, the bees will leave. So that, that's, that's pretty profound. And in this country, they're, they're not even addressing the electrical smog issue, the EMF issue at all with the bees. And first and foremost, I believe it has to do with malnutrition because the bees' food is the pollen and the nectar. And the soil, we know, has been deficient for a solid hundred years. And when you have a diminished food source, you have a diminished immunity, you have a diminished organism. And I'm finding that Bees that are fed extra minerals and extra food to increase their nutritional density don't have these problems like the, the bees that are being worked 
continually year-round in these uh, conventional agricultural systems. Okay. Now, uh, this has been occurring for about five, six years now. Um, has it been getting worse, or has the situation been improving? <clears throat> I don't see any improvements from where I'm, or from my view. Um, some, pe some beekeepers are overcoming and adapting, so they're getting some increase in health. But overall, um, I mean, I've been traveling around the country talking to a lot of beekeepers, and I don't see, I don't see it getting any better. I, I see it continually getting worse. Okay. Now, um, I mean, is there anything we, the public, can do, you know, to, to make the situation better? Well, like they're doing out in California where they're standing up and protesting against uh, this, the use of pesticides. Um, that's where we can, as a consumer, do something because we can demand that we don't have the pest, you know, don't use the pesticides on, on the food. Um, the, uh, the laws can be changed, but there again, it comes down to personal act activism. You, you can vote with your money or act, be active w with what you buy. Now, in, in your opinion, I don't know how much you would know about this, but do you think this could have been orchestrated? I mean, do you think this is, uh, you know, there's a, a system behind this that's possibly uh, making this happen? There sure seems to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there, there sure seems to be because the, uh, with these patents that are coming out lately, I mean, they even have genetically modified bees now. They have uh, pesticides that have been created in a fashion to affect not only the plants, but the pollinators too. They have plants that actually create their own pesticide within the plant to kill insects. Well, bees are insects. So could it be, it sure appears to be there could be a plot or a plan or uh, something uh, in the shadows, if you will, conspiratorially, but it, it's affecting the bees regardless. Now you talked about other instincts just briefly just now. I know you focus mostly on bees, but is a similar occurrence um, happening with other insect, uh, insects that you know of? I'm finding yes, like right, right here uh, in Texas, I've noticed just being inquiring with people, they noticed that the local pollinators, the wasps, the, the other types of bees that are just naturally in the environment that pollinate, the crops, they're not here. Um, several states, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, I've been asking, and you know, the local insects, they're not as, they're not as populated as they used to be. They're just not there. People have said in their gardens, they actually have to go out with a Q-tip to pollinate their own garden because there's no bees, there's no wasps, there's no other natural pollinators at all around. And you have to have pollination to have food. At least 70 to 80 percent of our food chain requires pollination and if there's nothing pollinating the flowers we don't get food. So this could be far-reaching. This is huge reaching. Yes. Now you've talked a little bit about solutions. I know that you were talking to me briefly about you know you're part of solutions. You offer products where you know it, it contributes to the solution. T tell me a little bit about that. Well yes it it started with my own beehives and my own research, so my endeavors were selfish in the beginning. But the, uh, I've been working in uh, bioremediation bio or helping the environment heal using natural things, and I've just applied some simple principles to the beehives because my beehives became extremely toxic, and then the bees died or they left. So we're just using simple remedies applied in a different fashion to the beehive. So we're decontaminating the beehive, we're helping the bees' digestion increase, and we're feeding the bees food that's missing from their natural diet, the elements that are missing. So the bee then is gaining immunity, their beehive is becoming cleaner, so their house is clean, and their overall health is impacted greatly for the positive, so they can actually exist in this chemical environment that they have to work and live in to, to do their job. Now have a lot of other experts who work with bees have, uh, you know, do you have any success stories uh, with them? 
I have quite a few success stories with beekeepers that are using our products. Um, we, we've had a couple of beekeepers that, uh, one is a fairly large one, he has over 2,000 hives. Uh, he was experiencing really big losses, like 40 to 50 percent loss annually. And using our products, he's virtually cut his losses completely in regards to colony collapse loss. Because when the bee is healthy, it's able to re repel the bacteria and fungal problems. Uh, when the bee is healthy and the immune system is up, it's able to clean the hive and keep the hive clean. When the bee is healthy, it doesn't lose its homing instincts and it can find its home and its hive. Uh, when the bee is healthy, they can lay eggs. They can multiply and do their job much more swiftly and much more... Um, uh, well, just better. Mm -hmm. Well, doctor, it's great to see that, you know, you're fighting the good fight on this. Um, is there any last uh, message that you would like to uh, tell the viewers? Well, just get to know your local beekeepers and be supportive and then be active. Because without consumers buying the produce and the honey and the products, th that's, where, that's the backbone of the food chain. And the bees are extremely important. So just be active and get to know your local beekeeper and support any way that you, that you can. Okay. Well, doctor, thank you so much for joining us here on InfoWars Nightly News. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you once again for joining us this evening. Remember to continue supporting our operation, continue fighting the good fight. And there's many ways that you can do that. One way is by becoming by going to InfoWarsStore.com and um, purchasing some of our wonderful products, whether it be our new magazine that's come out. It comes out every month, but pretty soon it's going to be unveiled later on this week. This month's episode, we're going to focus on zombies. And remember, you can also become a member of PrisonPlanet.tv for less than $6 a month. You'll get a lot of goodies. You'll be able to see Alex's radio show daily. Check out some of his rants, have access to wonderful ebooks, documentaries, all in high def, and it's less than $6 a month, and that also helps to fund our operation. And once again, remember the magazine. It should be coming out later on this week as well, the InfoWars magazine, and you can get those also as well on our website. Well, we'll see you tomorrow evening. Until then, have a wonderful, wonderful evening.